Man, uh, I get the privilege. We're going to end our series on uh, Bring Out the Book. Can you say that with me? Bring Out the Book. So let's do that. Bring out the book if you want. We've got, or if you want, please bring out the books. If you've got your physical Bible, grab that. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter five. Uh, if not, we're gonna have. You can go to BeaconHill.life. All of our scriptures for today are gonna be right there under message notes, and we'll have the scriptures right on the screen. But um, as you turn, as you get there, will you stand with me? Um, and you can look at the screen, look at your Bible. But let's uh, read. Let's come and stand in honor as we read the word of the Lord this morning. And we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, by any means will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others according will be least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Now, it was my sophomore year at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, One day, I was leaving my first class, riding my skateboard uh, across campus to my next class, when all of a sudden, a large crowd gathered in the middle of campus caught my eye. The closer I got, the more I could hear arguing and yelling. Soon, I saw that the crowd of students were mostly observing uh, uh, one man and two students seeming to go back and forth taking turns shouting at each other. And then I saw it. Uh, A a tall sign propped up at the end of an eight-foot PVC pipe in bold letters reading, God hates you. Sodomites, abortionists, drunkards, just the way you are. Now, street preachers uh, going to a public college like that, street preachers were a, a, a very common thing. Once a week, we'd see someone often wearing a sandwich board with some version of John 3.16 written on it, and would try to engage students in a discussion about faith, sin, and all of the things to present the gospel. And, and though I agreed with their theology, I think their, their methods were probably a little flawed, but this man was different. The man uh, standing there was different. The, the man screaming back at students, PVC pipe in hand, was quoting scripture after scripture after scripture. But there was no presentation of the good news of the gospel. See, he had weaponized the Bible to promote hate rather than hope. Rather than calling for repentance and love, he called down fire, for, of ju- the fire of judgment. Now, see, he had read the Bible, committed large swaths to memory, but his life didn't reflect the very good news he was called or so was supposed to proclaim. We see that happen, right? Whether it's, it's, it's the, the picketers at a public campus or maybe it's Westboro Baptist Church, which isn't really a church, it's just an organization, standing outside a fallen soldier's funeral with signs that read, thank God for dead soldiers. See, from Priests in Spain during the Spanish Inquisition to slave traders during the slave trade. People have known, read, and quoted scripture, yet conducted their lives contrary to the very teachings that are found in the Bible. Even in our day, right, we know people who know the scriptures, but they live as if it has no bearing at all on the way they see or live their life. And we ourselves can even find ourselves, maybe not in the the atrocities of of the Spanish Inquisition or the slave trade or or picketing and, and promoting hate, but even in our own selves, finding ourselves where we read Scripture where we are more the subject and the Bible the object. And it means in a way for us to seem to control these Scriptures. You may know the Bible, have read the Bible, maybe you you know the stories, but the question is, have you become more loving, joyful, and peaceful like this Jesus of Nazareth? 
So he leaves us with the question as if this book that we, we've talked about, how it, it, it gets bring out in a culture of biblical illiteracy, the importance of the word as we, we come and we've talked about how it's God speaking to us. But when we can see the damage that can be done at the hands of these words, the question still will loom, what is the point of reading this old book? As we come at it and we can see the, both the, the, the highs and the lows, we can see its abuses and that what, does it still have relevance? What is it for? What is the point of reading this book? And see, as we come at it today, we could spend all, all day talking about can we trust the Bible and, and its claims on itself, and that's important. You know, may, many will come and they'll put the Bible on trial, which I believe maybe you may need to do to go through your faith, but that's not the right posture as we approach Scripture See, what's the point of reading this old book? Because see, how we read the scripture, how we read the Bible really matters. The posture we have as we approach the holy scriptures makes a difference. See, the Bible has, has been used and formed in different ways that aren't its intent. See, the Bible itself is not some of the things that we've made it out to be. The Bible itself is not a theology dictionary. What I mean by that is that the, that the Bible is, is not this thing that exists to give me precise definition about theological issues. It's not a theology reference book. Though we can gain theological insights, though we can gain insights as to how we, we practice and follow and, and understand God, it's not a reference book that we turn to to answer those questions. See, we need to move from the idea that the Bible teaches us truth about theological topics, though we can gain truth about theological. We need to move from the idea that it teaches us those things to the idea that it's meant to be meditated upon and to see it in our hearts and our souls, not merely an understanding or an intellectual pursuit. The Bible is not a theology dictionary, but the Bible also is not a moral handbook or rule book. This is the idea that the Bible exists solely to give clear rules from God about how to live our life. Now, given, don't take, me, don't take this wrong, the Bible is full of God's moral law. God's moral law is there. God's, there's plenty of morality in Scripture, but it's full of both God's moral law and man's broken, fallen nature. See, the scriptures are not just a book on how to live life. It's not a life hack to a better life. We need to move from the idea that the Bible is some rule book or handbook on how we live our life to the Bible as God's wisdom or wisdom literature that can transform our character through God's spirit. And lastly, the Bible is not just some devotional grab bag. You know what I mean? The devotional grab bag. When you, you go and you try to find that scripture, maybe you search in Bible Gateway, you try to find that scripture, just it's going to meet you where you are. The, it's this idea that the Bible exists to find personal inspiration and connection to God. So you pick and choose what inspires you and makes me just feel God's presence. But see, the Bible is not just a grab bag of different inspirational stories that can warm our hearts, but it's one unified story. And if we only pick and choose the parts that kind of speak to us, we miss the breadth of Scripture, the, the, the broadness of what God is doing, and we easily can take Scripture out of what God's intent into our own context, meaning we read Scripture out of its context. See, we need to move from the idea that we can pick and choose how the Bible should influence our own individual lives to seeing the Bible as inspired literature, meaning that what Pastor Randy talked about, God-breathed literature that is meant to re be read and reflected on to discover how li our lives fit into God's grand story and purpose for creation. So if, that, if that's the idea, maybe, maybe that kind of attacks our way of we've grown up to hear the Bible, that this is this book that gets a handbook for life, but it's, it's not that. It's something more. It's not that. It's not, it's not just a, a, a dictionary that gives us theology, tells us what the right doctrine is. It's, it's more than that. It's not that. It's not, it's not the, its intent. See, we can find theology. We can find morality. We can find connection and devotion to God in these scriptures, but our 
our, our, our approach, our perspective, our paradigm, our posture as we come to this book matters. See, as we come to this point, we need to move from these, these ideas into what is the Bible. And the only way we can know what the Bible is supposed to be or what is its intent. Why do we still read it? It's not because of the, all the things, because the world can, can give us all the, its own arguments and things. Why do we believe? Well, it comes down to Jesus. We follow, we come, and we, have, we sang today, I've decided to follow Jesus. And the question is this morning is how did Jesus see these, this scripture? How did Jesus see the scriptures? And so that brings us to our, our teaching text we read just a minute ago. In, in Matthew chapter 5, I'll, I'll read it again. It says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus as he's delivering his sermon on the mount. He's, he's saying this idea of scripture. And what he's saying is, is, you know, people are asking in the crowd, is he changing the law? He's telling us something different than the, the Pharisee. What I, what, is, he, is, he, is he undermining? Is he getting rid of the law? Especially as, as you know, Christians, believers, you know, centuries Centuries past this, we often kind of discount, right? Oh, well, we're in the new covenant. These things don't matter. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm not, I'm not coming to undermine, change, alter, or get rid of the scripture. But he says these words that I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill, right? I've not come to abolish, but fulfill. And oftentimes we hear the scripture, oh, you know, God's going to fulfill. And we can see the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, right? Read through the book of Isaiah and, and, and we see, we just, you know, Christmas time, we read out of Isaiah this, this promise to come and uh, this Messiah that's going to come. And we, we read the scriptures and there is prophecy that prophesies all over the Old Testament that prophesies the coming Messiah. And it is about that, but it's m so much more that Jesus is talking about. See, he didn't just say the prophecies in the law, the prophecies in the prophets, that's what's fulfilled in me. He says that I, that I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. It's that fulfillment, that word fulfillment. And we come at that point that, that, that Jesus says he's come to fulfill Scripture. That word fulfill literally means to fill them full. Right? Imagine a glass. I've got my, my, my coffee here. Imagine my glass that it, it's, it's about right here right now. If it's filled full, it's made full, made complete. He says that it literally, the, that he has come to fill the scriptures full, bring them to their completion. See, where Adam, in the beginning, God created Adam to, to co rule, to rule the, the garden, to walk and have relationship with him. And yet Adam, he's called, he's doing it, he's doing good, but then we know what? Adam messes up, right? Adam and Eve, they, they mess up in the garden, they fall and fail. See, where Adam didn't live up to God's plan for man, Jesus makes full. He becomes the Adam that doesn't fail. Where, where Moses delivers his people, he takes his people, God's people, out of slavery, delivers them, takes them to, through the desert, but as it comes time to cross into the promised land, Moses messes up. See, where Moses, where Moses falls short, Jesus fills it full. The deliverer that brings us all the way into the promise. That he is the new Moses. He is the new Adam. The, the, and you can go through David and Abraham. You can go time and time and see that Jesus does not just fulfill the prophecies, but the shortcomings of man are, and him, ourselves through the scriptures, is filled full. That Jesus becomes the Adam we need, the, the deliverer we need. He becomes the priestly king that we need. 
He fills the scriptures full. And see, the whole trajectory of the biblical narrative from the first pages of Genesis to the last words of the book of Revelation, the entire biblical narrative from page one to the last page is fulfilled in and through Jesus. That's why he is the Alpha and the Omega. He, the whole trajectory of the Bible is fulfilled through Jesus. That's why, as, as Pastor Renee shared last week, that story about the, the disciples on, their, on the way to Emmaus, right? Jesus had been crucified, buried. He rose again, but the word hadn't all gotten out yet. And there's two of these disciples, they're, they're walking, they're, their heads are down, they're, they're depressed, they're, they're, they're struggling. They're like, man, this is just awful. We hoped and our hopes were dashed. And Jesus comes to them, his, his identity is shrouded, they don't recognize him. And then as they, they begin to walk and talk, he begins to unveil the scriptures for them. He begins to reveal how all these things had happened. And this is what it says, as Jesus is talking to these disciples, it says this in Luke 24, verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So what is Jesus telling his disciples here? He's not just saying, see, like this and this and this, that was about me. This little thing here, this little thing here. No, no, no. He's saying, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, it's all about me. He's saying it's all about me, that I am the fullness, the full, the completeness of the law, of the prophets, of the Psalms, of the wisdom, the poetry of the Bible. I am its completeness. It is all made complete in me. It's all about me. But as Jesus talks to his disciples, he doesn't just stop and I fulfill all of this. I fulfilled, I fill up full the law, the prophets, the Psalms. But he continues in verse 25 and he, or 45, and he says, Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, This is what is written. This is the entirety of what the scriptures is about. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now you can type those words in your you know, Bible, Bible uh, program or on your website of the Bible app. And you're only going to find this kind of summation here. But what Jesus is doing is he's giving his summary of what all of the scripture is about. And he doesn't just say, hey, it's all about, you know, this grand plan that God's doing. No, he says, this is what all, this is the summary of Scripture, that the Messiah will suffer. The Messiah will raise from the dead, that that he will raise from the dead for the repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, that the Messiah will be preached in his name and it will go to all nations. That is the Scripture. See, what Jesus is saying is this text is not merely a a book of morals or devotionals. It's not just a place of theology, but rather this is a text that is a text about the Messiah. It's a messianic literature. It's messy. Everything is written to and pointing towards the Messiah. See, the Bible is a messianic text. That, That word Messiah... That's what we call Christ is the, the Greek word for, Messiah, for, for the Hebrew word Messiah. But that word Christ or Messiah, it means anointed one. So as you go through and you begin to look, that, that this it means anointed. It refers, and in the Old Testament, it refers to these two institutions. It refers to the high priest who would be the intermediary before God to the people and people to God. That the priest was anointed, the high priest of Israel was uh, the anointed one. And the second institution was the king. The, the king, King David, this, this, he's the, the priestly king. He's there as an intermediary. That idea, David was anointed. He was the anointed one. See, even in the, as we see the, the, the paint strokes through the Old Testament, we can see that it's about the Messiah. Paul, he reiterates this, the same thing that just teaching Jesus just gave to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, Paul reiterates in his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, For what I receive, I pass on to you, as of the first importance, 
as of first importance, the primacy, the primary thing, what I have received, I pass on to you. This is what the primary thing is, that Christ died for our sins according to the, according to the, thank you, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the, you see, Paul's echoing what Jesus just said. And, and make no mistake, Paul, Paul's writing and giving us the inspired word of the New Testament, but he is referring to the same scripture that Jesus is referring to, the same text as he comes, that all scripture, as it is written, know those things, that the Christ, the Messiah, died for our sins according to scripture, that he was buried, raised on the third day according to scripture. He's speaking to scripture because it's a unified story. See, the, the Bible, is, it, it, though it's made up of 66 books and all these various authors, and some are narrative and some are poetry and, and, and all the different genres and forms, yet here in this text, as we find ourselves, it's a unified story because it's unified at pointing towards the Messiah. From the very beginning to the very end, it's a unified story. You know, we've been using a lot in our Wednesday night Bible studies, using resources from the Bible Project. If you're not you know, familiar with that, you need to check it out. It's just great stuff for Bible study and just understanding Scripture. But they put this, this idea of a unified story that leads to Jesus, they put it this way, that the story of the Bible and all of its main themes come to fulfillment in Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the gift of the Spirit. The story of the Bible, all of its main themes... From the narratives to the books of poetry to the prophets to the, all of the things, it's all unified and leads to Jesus. That means that when we read the Bible, when we come and approach the posture when we approach this Bible, rather than reading ourselves into the story, we need to look for what God, what God is doing and where is the Messiah? Where is Jesus in, that, in the text? Let's give an example. You guys know the story of David and Goliath, right? So the Philistines, they're the enemy of God. They come, they challenge, they're challenging Israel, and they have this grand, great grand warrior. He's, a, he's described as this giant. And as he stands there, he's mocking the Israelites, mocking God. And here David is, he's, he's going to be the future king of, of Israel. He's anointed, the anointed one. And here he is, he goes, and, and, and he's bringing food for his older brothers, to kind of say, hey, I'm here to just help out. And so he's on his way, and then he hears this guy mocking Israel and mocking God, and he says, none of that. So he grabs, a, he goes to a stream, he grabs stones, he, he takes the stones, he throws them with his sling like he has for the lions that have attacked his sheep as a shepherd. And so he goes and he knocks Goliath out, he grabs Goliath's sword, cuts his head off, and these people are delivered. Now, how many of you know we've heard this story, right? Now, how many of you have ever heard it preached? And, I mean, it's, it's not that this is wrong, per se, but I want you to get this. You've heard it, right? Like, hey, you know what? As long as you just, just like David, when we stand firm in our faith, that God will take down the giants in front of us. Right? You've heard, have you heard that if you're in church? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's not the point. See, that's when we read ourselves into the story. I hear, I, David, am, as I stand for what's right, God's going to deliver, deliver the giants, and the giants will slay, be slain. But what about if we can see, we're just, we're, it may not be wrong, but we're missing the thrust of the greater biblical narrative. Now, see it this way. We can see it, look for the Messiah in the story. Now, here David is. He's been anointed. To be king of Israel. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's, he's a Messiah type. He's, he's meant to, he's the anointed one. That's the, the term it be. And here David is. He, he goes and, and here's a, a, someone who is the enemy of God's people. And, the, and you look at the way he's described. He's a giant, which there's a lot to that that deals with the Nephilim and all of that. And, and it's, we won't have time to go there. But you look at the way they describe Goliath. It says that his, his armor was an armor with scales. And then they describe his armor as bronze, all these things, four times, saying bronze this, bronze that, bronze this. Now there's something that we miss as we read this in English. 
But if you were a, a Hebrew reading through these scriptures, you would notice something. The root of the word bronze, so the three-letter three root in the word bronze is the same as serpent. So look at this. Here, here Goliath is, the enemy of God's people, and he's described wearing th this idea of the serpent. It's pointing to something. And he's described with scales just to make sure if you miss the whole thing about the bronze, that there's, there's this serpent-like character. And here he is. God, God is telling this. And, and what does it do? It's echoing back to Genesis. Right? Here, Genesis, Adam and Eve are in the garden, but they're deceived by a? Yeah, a serpent. Three, same word. They're just deceived by the serpent. And when they're deceived, they're the, he is the enemy of God's people, Adam and Eve. And there in the garden, he deceives them. He comes out and they're cursed. But so the serpent is also cursed. And what is the curse that, that God puts on the serpent? He says, you will crawl on your belly. And he says that the offspring of the woman will crush your head. Well, what does David do? David, here he comes, the anointed one, arrives. He sees this serpent-like giant defying the enemy of God's people. And so he, he goes before, and what he, do, he delivers God's people from the Philistines. And how does he do it? He doesn't kill him with a rock to the forehead. He grabs Goliath's sword, and he cuts off his head. You see the What's going on here? And then the reality is David, he, here he is, he delivers God's people. And what D David does to this Philistine warrior, Jesus fills to the full on the cross. Though, though, the, though the Philistine warrior Goliath was an enemy of God's people, the greatest enemy of God's people, still hid in the darkness, deceiving leading those into sin and darkness and brokenness. But Jesus, the Messiah, goes and confronts him and crushes the head. The offspring of the woman, born of a virgin, crushes the head of the serpent. It's made full in the cross. You see, the Bible is this unified story about Jesus. Now, do you see how the, the breadth of what you see in that story when we look for Jesus rather than ourselves? See, what happens, we often can turn the stories of the Bible into allegories, moral tales, rather than seeing the truth of the Messiah revealed in its pages. That's why Jesus, as he's teaching in the, book of, in the Gospel of John, he says this in John chapter 5. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. When you read David and Goliath, you're seeing the testimony of what the Messiah is going to do. It's testifying about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. See, the reality is, as we come and we approach the scriptures, we read the Bible, it's not merely that we just literally find Jesus in the passage, but rather, as we read the Bible, as we read, bring out the book, it leads us to Jesus and serves as an invitation to follow him. Whether we're reading the, the poetry of the Psalms, which echoes the heart of, of, of man to God, it leads us to Jesus as an invitation to follow him. Or the stories of the kings of Israel, it's an invitation to follow Jesus. Or we read the gospel accounts of, of, of Jesus walking, healing. Those who he comes in contact, it's an invitation for you and for us to not only see Jesus, but to follow him. Even as we read the book of Revelation, it's not just to give us the doom and gloom of the end of days, but rather it's, an, it's a revelation of Jesus and it's an invitation to follow him. What we have ascribed is to become Christians right? And that term Christian isn't something we came up with on our own, you know, after some point in history, but it's in, the, it's in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 11, the church at Antioch, it says they were the first to be called Christians. That word Christian, remember Christ just means, it's the Greek word for Messiah. So Christian in its simplest form means literally Messiah people. 
That you and I are invited not just to like ascribe to the terms and conditions of some set of beliefs, but we are, we are invited to become Messiah people. To partner with, to be people of the Messiah, followers of the Messiah, doing the work of the Messiah. That's why it, Paul writes in, in Romans 10 that Christ is the culmination of the law. Right? He's the culmination of, of the law of the scriptures so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. That we become Messiah people as Jesus has filled full the scriptures. And that begs the question when we read this text and we come at it and we begin to see that it's not just these things but it's, it's this messianic text that leads us and points to Jesus. As we read it, it begs the question, how can we be more like the Jesus revealed on its pages? Take that example of David and Goliath. Rather than seeing ourselves as David and we begin to see the Messiah, Jesus who is the great deliverer, who conquers the ultimate evil and the ultimate enemy of God's people. And we can approach that, and rather than placing ourselves, we look for Jesus in it, and we ask the question, what does this say about God? Every time we approach a text, we ask, what does this say about God? Where, can, where, can, where, where is God moving? What is, what, is the, what is the Messiah doing here? And where can I join with Christ? Maybe it's in this, this, book, this idea of David and Goliath is, is where can I join with Christ to be the deliverer? Where is there evil around me that needs to be confronted and struck down? See, we're become people who it's not just like we follow and we ascribe to the beliefs and we, we, we check the box, we believe the right stuff. It's no, that we become like our Messiah. And we participate in what he's doing. And then that idea of David and Goliath, Paul says in Romans 16, right? Remember the serpent being crushed in Genesis Genesis 3. In Romans 16, 20, it says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. See, all of a sudden we're partnered in crushing Satan the enemy of our soul under our feet. Not not by our own will. It says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan, but under our feet. We're partnered together. That this invitation into the story is in Jesus, and it's through Jesus. That's why as we kind of go through this idea that this this scripture is about Jesus, but our response to it is that we're invited to become followers, to become apprentices, to become like Jesus. That's why Paul, as he, as he talks to his, his mentee, his protege, and, and, and Timothy, he writes these words that we've, we, I think we've read a few times this, this month, that all scripture, and this is in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And you're like me and you, you grew up with the King James, the new King James. I like the way that, that, that they put it. It says that the servant of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Complete. That's the literal to be made complete. There's this idea That scripture does not just come to guide and to direct, though we find guidance and direction. But more importantly, its aim is to do a completing work of maturity in us, to complete the work of becoming more like Christ. This is that aim of our discipleship to Jesus, is to become more like him. That's why Paul continues in his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 5, it says this, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ, that he loved us and offered himself a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Imitate God in everything you do. The the pages of this text compel us to become more like God. 
That's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4 says, the word of God is alive and active. That was when we, you know this we're in church, right? It is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. To describing the, the scriptures as something that cuts. It's not a, I don't know about you, I don't like the, uh, do you like to get cut? I haven't had, you know, like knee replacement surgery, but the more you hear about it, you're like, oh my gosh, it sounds like the most painful thing. They cut, they dig out to replace. The word of God cuts, it molds, it shapes. It's, it's doing something, it's removing, and what is it doing? It's judging, it's not doing that because it's, it's meant to hurt or to harm, but rather it's forming us into something. The word of God is intended to form, to shape, to cut at our intentions, to, to begin to pull the sin, cut the sin out of the deep roots it has in our hearts and begin to form us into being God's image, image bearers of God born out, that we're made in God's image and the Bible is just trying to get us back to that place. And we become so thing because there's so often so many things that are, uh, that are attacking, so many things that are vying for our attention and to form us. If we asked ourselves more honestly, are we spending more time on watching and binging our, our, our entertainment or reflecting and meditating on God's word? Pull up, if you use the Bible app on your phone, pull up the, the screen time app and let's see the reality of what's forming us. See, the role of the Bible is not merely to just come in and, and make, and you know, happy days, we're going to make you more like Jesus and we're all good. See, the Bible is not just forming us, it's counterforming us. There are things in our lives and in our hearts that we have allowed to grow, whether it's the sin in our lives, the patterns of this world, all the things we read throughout Scripture, and what does it do? The Scripture comes to cut at them and pull them out that we may be made more like Christ, that we can be formed in his image. The word, the scripture, forms us into the image of God. I, I love this. Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline, it's one of the best book on spiritual disciplines. It's one of my favorites. And he says this in that book. It says, this discipline of reading the Bible is one of the most basic and foundational disciplines of the spiritual life. It's the primary means by which we discover the character of God and are changed into his likeness. It's the way we learn to walk with God. See, we can have all the right things, but if we don't spend time in the scripture, spend time with the Lord in the scripture, as we talked about last week, seeing the Messiah and being formed into his image, we miss out. So how do we do that? It starts really simple. We read it. So often we find barriers of time, schedule, attention span, our, our, our agendas for the day, and we just seem to set it aside. And maybe you've been joining us. We're, we've been encouraging you all month, like, get in the Bible. Read this year. Like, get in this words, even if it's just one verse a day right now. Maybe by the time we get to December, we'll go, we'll go longer. But just something we're encouraging you to join us as many of us are reading through the Bible with different reading plans and things, reading through the Bible together as a church. As we come to this point to be in the Word, we can't be formed by the Word if we're not, if we're not exposing ourselves to it. And by read, I don't just mean simply, okay, check the box. If we're not setting and letting it sit before our hearts, if you don't have time in the morning, then don't just try to cram it in. Spend time. Maybe it, it might take sacrificing some of the things we, we feel like we need to do, but man, we can become more like God. We become more like Christ as we reveal and sit before the scriptures. So how do we do it? Read, just simply read the scripture every day. More importantly, also, is to, not more importantly, but also read the gospels. You know, I've been, I've been going through, I'm using the Bible Projects, um, Bible Projects reading plan for the year, going through or in Exodus right now, and Going through all of that is great, but I'm still trying to read and stay in the Gospels because I want to keep Jesus fresh in our minds. Read the Gospels. 
If you struggle with reading the Bible, just start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then just keep on going. Like begin to read the Gospels, begin to see the nature of who Jesus is, how he was revealed as he came here on earth. Read those things. And as we come to that point that we begin to practice what we read. See, the reality of Scripture is just like it was described as in, in Hebrews. It cuts. Sometimes it cuts at our, our preconceived ideas. See, Scripture doesn't fit nicely on any, any earthly ideological spectrum. But it will challenge us. That we come at the scriptures and practice what we read. If it says to be generous, don't make excuses. If it tells us to love our neighbor and, 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 and we, we practice that, how we, we begin to read and apply what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus doing? And how do I practice what I read? <coughs> and as you come to the scriptures, it says to keep Jesus central to the story. I love the picture that's made and that the writer of hebrews writes they talk about all the the legacy of faith in scripture from from abraham and all the way down it goes through the the legacy of faith and it builds in this culmination this climax where it says there therefore as we're surrounded by a great crowd a cloud of witnesses he talks about us running this christian faith this christian life and it says fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Fix our eyes on Jesus. See, as we hold the scripture in our hearts and our minds and our <coughs> being, let us not forget to keep Jesus central to the story. I'll leave you with this this morning. is the Apostle John, as he's writing, his, he's writing a letter to the church. The Apostle John writes this in 1 John chapter 2. He says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are made in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Let us not be made liars. Let us not be people who are void of truth, though we may say we know that we would be people not merely who know the scriptures, but are formed by its words and formed by the Messiah revealed in its pages. A challenge to you this morning is don't, don't be made out to be that liar but be a Christian a Messiah person formed and shaped by and through the image and the person of Jesus thank you for listening to the Beacon Hill Church podcast if you'd like to find out more about Beacon Hill how to get involved or give just go to beaconhill.life and you'll find everything you need right there. We hope to see you soon. Take care.